Good morning. I'm here in Tunis, in Tunisia, or as the Americans insist on calling it, Tunisia. But I'm not here to show you Tunis. I'm here to take you next door to Libya. But before I take you to Libya, click subscribe, hit like, because it helps other people find the videos. So join me on a trip to Libya. So welcome to Libya, 1.8 million square kilometers, making it the fourth largest country in Africa and the fourth largest in the Arab world. Libyans can look nervously across neighboring borders like Chad, Sudan, and Niger. Mind you, to be fair, those people can look back across the border at Libya with the same amount of nervousness. The 17 million people of Libya are dispersed throughout the country with about a million living in the capital, Tripoli. And there are some parts of Libya that haven't received rain for up to 10 years. And that means that through history, the nomadic tribes, the cultures and the religions that have inhabited modern day Libya have developed some really interesting stories and cultural practices. Libya derives its name from Libu, which was the name given to this area during the 19th dynasty in the times of Ramesses II, and this is how you wrote it in hieroglyphics. Tripoli, on the other hand, gets its name from the ancient Greek for three cities, Tripolis, of which this one, Zagatha, is one. In the Phoenician days, this was an incredibly important trading port for the entire North African coast. And when you look at the North African coast, you can see just how close it is to Italy and Greece, which is one of the reasons Libya today is a kickoff point for the migrants. After the Punic Wars, it became Roman, which is when this theatre was built in the early years AD. An earthquake in 365, followed by the Islamic interventions and invasions in the 600s, meant that this town lost its importance and it now turned into the ruin. You want a little bit of irony. Along the top there was a whole lot of writing. The only word that remains is lacuna. Lacuna in Latin means missing. So the only word that's not missing is missing. This is an old Roman highway. This is the main east-west road from Carthage to Alexandria, complete with policemen. It's actually in better nick than Route National 5 in Djibouti. So you're in Libya and you're hungry and you're plodding along on your camel and you come across this wall. Suddenly you're happy because you think you might be fed. Why? Let's go inside and have a look. Food was often stored in old granaries like this one. This is about a thousand years old and has 140 rooms of storage. <laughs> What a spectacular place and you can understand why people wanted to live here for millennia. And when you think about millennia, people lived in Libya for hundreds of thousands of years. So if you ask the question, who are Libyans? You've got to ask from when? The Carthaginians were here, the Phoenicians were here, the Greeks were here, my favorite, Alexander the Great was here, the Romans were here. And in fact, the Berbers have been here at least 10,000 years. And the term Berber was only used after the coming of the Arabs to North Africa. Before that, the Berbers saw themselves as a distinct groups. The extreme west and the extreme east of Berber territory, the language group was so different they couldn't understand each other. A bit like Scottish and American English. Now I'm in Termissa, which is a traditional village of the Berber people. The Berbers themselves resisted Roman rule, they resisted Phoenician rule, they resisted Arab rule and they maintained an independent identity across multiple countries for many many years and still do. Now you see the symbol on the Berber flag it's Azul which is Berber for welcome. That's the Arabic for welcome as well. Apparently this was a really strong fortress in the Berber days when the Romans were here and this place was really known for giving the Romans a hell of a problem because they had all these secret tunnels that took them from the valley up to the top here and the Romans just couldn't get them. This little tunnel here has been around since Roman times and was used by the Berber people here to escape from the Romans or if they were down in the valley come up to the hill. On this doorway which is now an abandoned mosque are old Christian symbols showing the early Christian history of Libya, which was in fact the first Nicene Christian country in the world. Now for those who are interested in this sort of thing, outside Gadamas is the three-way border point between Tunisia, Algeria and Libya. And I'm basically standing on it. 
that's Tunisia, that's Algeria, and that's Libya. This is ancient Gadamus in Libya. It dates back thousands of years. No one's really quite sure how old. This mosque dates to 44 in the Islamic calendar. That is 600 and something in the Christian calendar. Gadamus was critical in the North African salt trading route and has been destroyed and rebuilt a number of times in the various conflicts. So Gadamus is a Berber town, but like a lot of things in Libya, it's not that simple. With the arrival of Islam and the Arabs, the ethnic makeup of the area and the languages changed. So whilst many people claim to be Berber, there's now a lot of mixed ethnic heritage here between the invading Arabs, the Muslims and the pre-Islamic Berbers. Now check this out for the weirdest shaped palm tree you'll ever come across. So these alleyways of Gadamus are largely covered because of the heat and generally only the men walk down them. Women would in the mornings, but the main reason women wouldn't is because they communicated between rooftops because that's where the kitchens were. So a desert needs water and here in Gadamus, similar to the irrigation channels through the United Arab Emirates, you've got these that go right through the city. And the way people paid for it is very similar to the irrigation ditches in rural Victoria actually. They put little gates down and block the water off if you haven't paid. So this is a traditional irrigation system going back thousands of years which isn't too different to the ones running outside Lockie's farm today. Another piece of trivia which is interesting is when you go to the doors, if you see these ones with the leather decorations, that means the person who lives in the house has done the Hajj. There's a great romance about Berber history and the Barbary coast. And around the end of the 17 and 1800s, a lot of European countries had to pay tribute to the Berbers. In return, they would allow trade freely within the Mediterranean Sea. When the United States won its Revolutionary War, one of its first peace treaties was with Morocco in 1777, allowing US merchant vessels to pass through the Straits into the Mediterranean Sea. And Morocco's friendship agreement with the United States is the United States' oldest continuing peace agreement. Maybe that's why Donald Trump threw Western Sahara under the bus and recognized Morocco's sovereignty. The problem is the Berbers kept raiding and taking slaves as far as Iceland. And many countries, including the United States, had to pay tribute to the Berbers. And yes, you heard that right. The Americans paid tribute to the Berbers. The Americans had a huge debate around the time of the 1800 presidential election between Adams and Jefferson. And the issue was, do we spend our money to build a navy or do we keep paying tribute to the Berbers? Jefferson argued to build a navy, which he did, and kicked off the first Barbary War, which was essentially to fight with a number of European countries to get freedom of navigation inside the Mediterranean without being pillaged by Berber pirates. Berbers were not only pirates, but they took slaves, lots of them. The slave trade across the Atlantic is known for taking three million black African slaves to the Americans. At around about the same time, the Berbers took 1.5 million Europeans slaves. And that's why we hear so much debate about Libya, Tunisia and Algeria having to pay slave reparations to Europeans. No, we don't hear that. So I've spoken a lot about the Berbers and you'd be right to say, wasn't this within the Ottoman Empire? And the answer is, well, yes, but the Ottomans let the Berbers pretty much rule themselves. And it wasn't until 1911 in the Turkish-Italian War that the Italians finally took control over the territory that's now Libya. That has left a couple of legacies, one of which is good coffee. Really good coffee and not an espresso capsule to be seen. But it also meant that during World War II, this was the heart of the North African campaign. And indeed, Tobruk is in Libya, but it's way over on the eastern side, which we can't get to for security reasons at the moment, which disappoints me a little because my grandfather was involved in the evacuations of Tobruk. Now, after World War II, Libya got its independence under a monarch, King Idris I. And King Idris I ruled until he was overthrown in a military coup in 1969 by Gaddafi. Gaddafi is remembered as being a brutal dictator and involved 
involved in terrorism, the bombing of the Pan Am flight over Lockerbie, and associated international crimes. Now, this building in Ganarmouth is actually on the 20 Dina note. And the reason it is, is because it was the first girls' school here. Now, the history of Libya, modern history, is actually very good for women's rights, at least under Gaddafi, because what Gaddafi did is he made it illegal to pay men and women differently. He made it illegal for women to marry without their permission. He made it illegal for women to marry under the age of 16, so he's pretty good on women's rights. Although some of it was a little bit loopy, particularly when he insisted his personal bodyguard were all female, all attractive. Didn't help him when he ultimately died in a ditch with a bayonet in his stomach. Modern day Libya is a little bit of a basket case at the minute because the country is split between at least two different components following the fall of Gaddafi. So modern day Libya might get some bad press every now and again, but I'll tell you my experience here in Tripoli is that everyone has been friendly, everyone has been hospitable, to the point that in cafes people have refused to take money from us because we're tourists, we're guests in their country. And it reminds me that I find that traveling in Islamic countries tends to be better than traveling in Christian countries. People tend to be more hospitable. The only other country in the world that I've ever had a cafe refuse to take money because I'm a guest is in Iran. Oh, and Andrew's hamburgers in South Melbourne. Now, as I'm watching the sunset across the desert of Libya, and you know how much I love deserts, time to say goodbye from Libya. Look, I'm not the only dickhead that travels to every country in the world. In fact, I'm one of the least travelled in this group. Come on, come on. Just need one